There has been a passage in the Bible that I think God really wants to speak to us through. In Luke 12, Jesus said to the crowd, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say it's going to rain and it does. And when the south wind blows, you say it's going to be hot and it is. Hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? Jesus is speaking to people who see his earthly ministry and his miracles and his teaching and they don't recognise him as God's son and they don't recognise what God is doing through him. But I think there's a principle in there that we are called to interpret the times. I've been really hesitant to offer an interpretation because there is so much interpretation out there. But I'm really concerned that people look to online teaching and videos and people they don't know with no authority for that teaching. I've been wary to offer my own teaching because in James 3, it says that those who teach will be judged even harsher. And Jesus actually says in Luke 17, um, and he says it also in Matthew, that anyone who leads people astray, it'd be better for them to have a millstone tied around their neck and be thrown into the sea. So it's a serious thing to offer an interpretation and a teaching of the scriptures and what the spirit is saying. But I think there's a lot of people who are doing that too easily. And there are a lot of um, ideas going around about what's happening that I just don't think are true. God has been really speaking to me and I feel like he's actually been preparing me for this season for about a year um, last summer, I felt God say that we were coming into a season of sowing seeds. So I've spent the past nine months thinking about how we can do evangelism and sharing the gospel and events. And yet whenever I try to plan something or put something together, I felt God say again and again and again, wait I went away on a retreat expecting to um, have some ideas about plans for the future and what God was going to do next. And instead, God just spoke to me about who I am and about what he's calling me to do. And I felt he's been doing the same in this season. I've been having really vivid dreams and really vivid um, pictures from God. And God's been speaking to me in, in prayer and in the Bible in, in profound ways. I think he's been speaking to us at Mill Village Church through that as well. Um, this passage that I read comes before Luke 13, which we felt God call us to go through. All of our sermon series I really pray about and I feel like they're prophetic words from God that he wants us to to hear in the season we're in. At the start of the year, I really felt led by God to do a series on spiritual formation and prayer in the Psalms. And I think that was preparing us personally for this season. Um, I think God has stopped us doing some things so that we wouldn't start things we'd have to then try and maintain in lockdown. But also because whatever comes next is the thing that God is wanting us to do. But I think one of the challenges is that in waiting for whatever God wants to do next, a lot of Christians don't have a theology of suffering. There is a lot of suffering in the Bible. Most key figures who do anything meaningful for God suffer. And it's not that we have to suffer to feel God's love and God's blessing, but it's that God uses the pain and the challenge of suffering to grow us, to expand our hearts, to make our spirits more sensitive. And often the time of trial and suffering and isolation can be long. Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness before God called him in, back into Egypt. Jesus didn't start his ministry till he was 30 and then immediately started it with 40 days in the desert being tempted by Satan himself. Um, this happens throughout the Bible. Paul um, speaks of a time going out to Arabia for two, three years before he is called to Antioch. Um, this is a powerful thing throughout the Bible and actually God, I think, wants to use this isolation to prepare us but we struggle. We struggle with any of our personal kind of freedoms or ability to gather as a community being held back. Some people see it as an attack on the church by states and by governments, by them uh, inhibiting our freedoms to gather together. But the truth is, the church in the West has been 
declining and it's been becoming less spiritual when society is more open spiritually and when God is wanting to do more by his spirit than ever. And I think actually it's a good thing that the churches are closing right now in order for God to reset them and make them what he wants them to be. I think God is clearly doing something in this time. And I think it's to do with the Antichrist, which a lot of other people have spoken about in other videos about who the Antichrist is and what the Antichrist is doing in this season. But I want to explain, I think, a revelation that I've had of who the Antichrist is as I've studied the scriptures and prayed about it and wanted to respond to some people who've been asking me about about the Antichrist and about things that have been happening. The Antichrist isn't actually spoken of in that many places in the Bible. In fact, some of the central passages in the Bible that talk about God's character and God's salvation don't mention the Antichrist at all. In fact, there's only two books of the Bible, and that's 1 John and 2 John, written by the same author, that use the word Antichrist. Um, but there are a few passages, and I think they're all important to look at. Um, the main passage that people often turn to is in Revelation 13, where it talks about uh, the beast and the dragon. And the first thing to say is that Antichrist isn't uh, the enemy of Christ. It's someone who pretends to be Christ in order that we would worship and follow him instead. So the Antichrist mirrors Jesus. He comes on a white horse. He is in uh, a three, like Jesus's father, son, spirit. Um, within that three, the Antichrist is there with the beast and the false prophet. Um, he has his own crown. He has his own authority. He performs signs. He even seems to come back from the dead. He mirrors Jesus and a lot of that imagery is also drawing upon Daniel 7, where there is another beast with horns. And these two books uh, have in them these scenes of the apocalypse. But apocalypse doesn't mean end of the world. Apocalypse means revelation. Apocalypse means when God reveals the spiritual reality behind what is happening on earth. Interpreting the time, as Jesus said in Luke 12. Um, and... In their context, where they were going through real suffering and trial and pain, where people were being killed for praying, for believing, um, God reveals to them the spiritual battles, that they would understand what God is doing, what Jesus is doing, what the enemy is doing, and how God will use it and lead them through it. And I think God would want to do the same to us. Um, that number, hopefully you've heard this before, but in, in Revelation 13, the number 666 represents the name of an emperor, Emperor Nero, who hated Christians and killed them. And um, those pictures in Daniel are clearly shown to speak about uh, the history and the empires and the different dictators that rose and fall. And they make us think of, um, they make us think of, figures who have done that throughout history terrible dictators who have slaughtered thousands and millions of people and the first truth about that about the antichrist is um that there are antichrists in those letters written by john that we looked at where the, where the word antichrist occurs the only place in the bible it uses antichrists there are multiple antichrists there isn't one figure we are waiting for there have been antichrists throughout history. Those writers were writing about their own context in Revelation and in Daniel. And yet by the truth of God, as he has inspired his scripture, it has been revealed to be true again and again and again. In fact, uh, even in John, it speaks about the spirit of the antichrist. And I think there is a spirit of antichrist within each generation. That is, there is something that stands in the place of Jesus and says, come under my authority, come under my judgment and worship me instead of Jesus. And I think a question is, what is God revealing to us? Who is the Antichrist that is being revealed to us in this season? A lot of people have said that one of the ways we can determine the Antichrist is by looking at the mark of the beast. And then people have had all sorts of theories about what the mark of the beast is. But they miss 
the, me- the plain meaning of the Bible and what God is saying through his scripture. The mark of the beast it wasn't some physical thing as much as people have tried to make out. I think the mark of the beast mirrors when God gives his law to his people in Deuteronomy. Um, I think it's Deuteronomy 6. Let's have a look. It says, let's see if I can find it. Six four. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk up the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. The mark of the beast is... The worship of the Antichrist and coming under his authority rather than under the authority of the law of God. We are to write the law of God on our hands and our heads and on our hearts. And when the Antichrist comes, it's his name. It's his worship that we place on us. It is the Antichrist that is loved. And we've seen that. We've seen great and terrible evil men throughout history do wicked things commit mass genocides and be adored by their followers and i think there's there's something quite profound in that when we when we look at that through history um when we look then at one and two john that speak about the antichrist there's this clear definition of what the Antichrist is. It is whoever denies that Jesus came in the flesh. And again, I think there's an important theological point in that, in that you can believe that Jesus is God, fully God, that he is the one of authority to be worshipped. But if you don't believe that Jesus came in the flesh, you don't believe in his cross for salvation, for new life, you don't believe that he died, for your sins, that you were caught in your sin, that you were dead, that you were alienated, that you're an enemy of God, and now Jesus has brought you into relationship with the Father. But also you don't believe in the way that Jesus lived his life and came under the authority of the Father and came under actually the law during his time. He fulfilled the law. And that that isn't something that any Antichrist uh, submits to or obeys to. They see Jesus as a distant, far off God, but I am the judge. I am the ruler. So whoever denies Jesus came in the flesh is one of the Antichrists, has the spirit of the Antichrist, wants our worship, wants our affection, our devotion instead. Um, I think that chimes with Thessalonians, where there's another passage that talks about the lawless one, which people say talks about the Antichrist. And actually... Um, I think it makes sense that the Antichrists are described as the lawless one because to not write the law of God in our head and our heart and our hands is to write the law of the Antichrist instead. And he is one without law. Cast off any restraint. Don't follow God. Follow me. Do what you want. We will kill. We will make ourselves rich. We will destroy God's creation because it's part of my plans and my purposes and what I want to do. I think there's only other one other passage that's often uh, referred to when we're talking about this is when Jesus talks about pseudo Christs or false messiahs, and he's he's talking again about people who come and and pretend to be him. So the question is, who is pretending to be the Christ? Who is the one asking for our worship? And our adoration, whose name do we have written on our <clears throat> minds as we think, on our hearts as we worship, on our hands as we do things? And I think actually there's something really clear that I think God has revealed to me about who the Antichrist is. The Antichrist in our age is me, is you, is the individual, is the self. The spirit of the Antichrist in our age is self worship is a total casting off of any restraint. People nowadays read the law of God and think it is oppressive and evil because 
it tells people they can't have sex with whoever they want to. They can't eat whatever they want to. They can't um, get rich or abuse other people or um, just treat others however they want to. And they, we just worship ourselves. What I find fulfilling and satisfying and pleasurable is the most important thing. As a society, we are obsessed with pleasure and personal freedom. People talk a lot about their rights, but never about their responsibilities. In fact, some of the protests to the lockdown have been a response to that. How dare you affect my freedom? I want to do whatever I want. Oh, this is some conspiracy to end my freedom because they don't care about the vulnerable and most needy in our society who will suffer the most when this virus spreads. They don't care about the thousands and thousands and thousands of older people dying in care homes across our planet. In fact, this virus came about because people decided they could eat whatever they want and we got a disease from a bat because people decided they could trap whatever animal, whatever wildlife they want, sneak it into a market, sell it illegally, make money illegally because of greed, because of selfishness, maybe because of desperation as well because of the poverty and, and circumstance they're in. And they believed in a limitless existence. I can do whatever I want to provide, to get, to, to grow rich. And because of that, we have a virus that has literally killed thousands of people across the world and is deeply affecting lots of people that I know, that you know. Uh, we are lawless. The Antichrist is the self, is the individual, in this generation how on earth how on earth do we get back from that we have to die to self jesus calls us to take up our cross we need to take off the mark of the antichrist of i will do whatever i want and we need to submit to jesus and to his law we need to submit to community to one another we need to submit to being together. We are in the middle of an apocalypse. Not in that it's the end of the world right now, but in that God is revealing the spiritual reality behind what we are doing. God is revealing that if we keep living, imagining we can do whatever we want and have all the freedom in the world, we will kill ourselves. We will literally destroy ourselves, just like our abuse of creation is destroying ourselves. If we keep worshipping ourselves and worshipping money as a God, we will destroy ourselves. Because we become like that which we worship. And if all we worship is lust and greed and power, we'll just become empty, hollow, broken pursuits of nothingness. Whereas if we love one another, if we take the mark of Jesus on us and take the cross on us, we will give our lives for one another. We will sacrifice our freedom for one another. We will give all of our money and possessions and life for one another. What God has revealed in this society is that we are unequal, that those who work in key roles are, are mostly from immigrant black and minority ethnic backgrounds and they are dying more than rich white people are. God is revealing what an unequal and unjust society we are, what a broken world we are. God is revealing that we have so built up systems of capitalism around the world that take no care for creation and are destroying the planet because of carbon emissions that will just come that just collapse in on itself i've been looking at uh, even just the phone i have i've been looking at how actually it's built by a company that in in china that use forced labor from prisons that it's built using minerals mined by children in africa i'm not i'm not going to use this phone anymore i'm going to get a new phone if it has to be a rubbish phone or a different phone in order to, to make it work. Because God's really convicted me about how little I care about the state of my brothers and sisters in the world, about the state of his children throughout the world. God has revealed that and he's had to stop all of our 
commerce. He's had to stop all of our empty worship in churches on a Sunday to make us realise who we truly worship and how we need to change. I think Jesus would lead us to repentance. And I think we should take this season to stop, reset, to return our hearts to God, to love him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, to be devoted to him once again. To turn away from our self, who we have placed in the place of Christ, and submit to his law. I hope that in the messiness of just my thoughts on what the Bible is saying and what, what God is saying through his spirit right now, I hope that God blesses you with his love and that you return to him, and that you realise a life of surrender, submittance to his law, to his will, to his heart, is a life full of meaning and purpose and fulfilment. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen.